Hello, I'm Dr. David Johnson, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Gastroenterology at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, I'm just back from the American College of Gastroenterology, which, by the way, is just now recently been reported to be the largest gastroenterology association in the world. Again, annual meeting this year was held in Las Vegas. It was live and real. Uh, there was a combination hybrid of virtual and, and on-site presence. It's so good to reconnect with colleagues in person and not on a Zoom call. Let me give you some of the highlights. There are over 3,500 abstracts submitted, and I've called through uh, the all of these basically and looked at the plenary and poster presentations to give you what I thought my perspectives, how I think it reflects on clinical practice, maybe practice changing or practice informing going forward. First was a very nice concept uh, presented by Dr. Joe Anderson from New, from New Hampshire. They looked at mean adenomas per colonoscopy versus the adenoma detection rate as a measure for quality and interval cancer protection. 9,000 plus colonoscopies evaluated, 138 colonoscopists and looked at interval cancer within three years. And they found that the Adenoma per colonoscopy is something that may be a very discriminant for interval cancer and, and protection, uh, as you would equate with adenoma detection rate. Added ADR of 25% recognizes the minimum threshold. They found that an adenoma per colonoscopy of 0.4 was on par with the ADR of 25%. You did better by about a third if you increase the adenoma per colonoscopy up to 0.6. Again, I think this is something that the guideline committees will look at and certainly start to evaluate a little bit more. It makes more sense that rather than just a one and done adenoma, perhaps that you should be evaluating how many you actually do detect over the, the course of the colonoscopy. Next as it relates to checkpoint inhibitor and the effects as it relates to immunotherapy mediated colitis and something as we see increasing adverse events as these agents are expanded in use from skin cancers, melanomas, breast uh, cancer, lung cancer, variety of neurologic uh, cancers. These are things that we're starting to see more common and these are, can be ranging from mild to severe. And the question is, do you need a full colonoscopy to make the diagnosis? This is a, a cross-sectional single center study involving 52 symptomatic patients and looking at the value of colonoscopy versus just the left-sided exam. They found that the left-sided exam, sigmoidoscopy, diagnosed 100% of these patients. It did not add more to go further and do biopsies more proximally. Virtually 100%. Teaching point here was very important to recognize. Biopsies were from normal colon, increased the diagnosis by 60%. And again, something that normal and abnormal biopsies, uh, again, relative to left-sided exam, may save for patients having to have a full colonoscopy. Two presentations as it relates to a new therapy just approved for ulcerative sort of colitis back in late spring of this year. And this relates to an oral sphingosine one phosphate receptor modulator as it relates to ulcerative sort of colitis. And this is approved in May for moderate to severe ulcerative sort of colitis, first of which was presented by Dr. Bruce Sands. Mount Sinai looking at the efficacy and safety in up to 52 weeks in a post hoc analysis, in particular as it relates to the evaluation of prior biologic exposure and the response to ozonamide. And there was really no effect as it relates to adverse uh, predictor for ozonamide if you had prior biologic exposure. It may have taken longer to get there, but it showed a very promising uh, sustained effect up to 52 weeks. This is an oral therapy, a one milligram daily dose, very promising as it relates to uh, a new application for our patients with ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> and then a follow-up on the safety was presented by Dr. Marie, uh, Marla Dubinsky, also from Monsanto. Again, looking at this, in this case, the safety over a 52-week window, they recognize there are no head-to-head -head randomized controlled studies, studies with this agent versus the other conventional biologics. Uh, and so what they did was, in the absence of this, use a matching adjusted indirect comparison with other studies and profiles are comparably same. And they looked at the, the implications for safety at 52 weeks, recognized that ozonamide had safety implications that were superior as it relates to adalizumab at both induction and maintenance, comparable to vedolizumab in induction, but better over maintenance therapy. So again, with a the new therapy, it's reassuring to see the safety profiles extended out for up to a year. And another new exciting agent as it relates to the inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this was presented by Dr. Dave Rubin at the University of Chicago and representing a multicenter phase three study, looking at this case of a uh, rizikizumab, which is a human immuno, uh, humanized immunoglobulin G1 monoclonal antibody. 
against the P19 subunit of interleukin-23. This was in moderate severe Crohn's disease in a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. Two doses of the intravenous uh, uh, rizikizumab, and, and it was something that showed no difference between the two doses. But at 12-week endpoint, using both uh, CDAI, clinical uh, uh, Crohn's disease activity index, uh, and a composite endpoint, also including endoscopic assessment, there was uh, sustained benefit and seemingly increased benefit both in remission and, and, uh, and improvement as it relates through week 12. So again, something that biologic therapy seemed to be a little bit laggard if you had not responded or had an incomplete response to biologic therapies going into this type of trial. But nonetheless, it was only 12 weeks, so we'll see. But this is something that I think is, again, extremely promising for moderate severe Crohn's disease. Next, as it relates to microbiome, there were a couple of very interesting presentations. First, as it relates to a randomized placebo-controlled trial in looking at C. diff and the relapse of C. diff. This was uh, studied from uh, uh, Dr. Jessica Allegretti and colleagues uh, presented uh, looking at a new agent as a as an oral therapy for C. diff recurrence. Patients defined at high risk. They had a washout following initial uh, antibiotic treatment, two-day washout, and then a oral therapy without a bowel preparation. And the primary endpoint was sustained clinical cure at week eight. They found a a benefit that was statistically significant as it relates to approximately 13% margin as far as superiority. NNT then would be approximately a little less than seven to eight. Again, something that value was that also seemed to change microbial diversity. So new potential therapy when approved that may again be helpful for preventing relapse of these patients. Now again, also the microbiome had an interesting concept of therapy as it relates to hepatic encephalopathy. This came from a study from the University of Michigan and looking at 10 patients, they had five donors and the patients were given five times uh, oral therapy over three weeks. And these are something that they looked at the six month composite scores and hepatic encephalopathy and showed there was a significant benefit for the patients getting the, the FMT and something that didn't seem to correlate with MELD scores and certainly didn't correlate with venous ammonia scores. But again, on the horizon, potentially new alternatives uh, as you start to look at patients and it didn't seem to be, uh, and these patients are also receiving rifaximin and lactulose. So again, it seemed to be additive to all those uh, current standards. One other as it relates to hepatic encephalopathy, as it relates to renal function, and this is something we don't traditionally use for prediction of relapse uh, related, post-TIPS related uh, hepatic encephalopathy. This is a study that looked at stratification by GFR, and a GFR less than 30, those are patients that uh, included GFR stage three kidney disease or on dialysis. They looked at 201 patients. They basically approximately 40% met the criteria for chronic kidney disease, and of these, 21% were actually hemodialysis dependent. They found that the odds ratio for this class was increased by 3.5 times greater hepatic encephalopathy at six months. So again, something that we really need to look at, perhaps stratifying better what we do for prediction of hepatic encephalopathy in these patients. Uh, this may be a new corollary, again, further work needed. As it relates to the, the uh, New therapy, new potentials uh, for the screening guidelines changing to 45 to 49. Dr. Osma Shaka and colleagues used the GI Quick Registry and looked at the threshold of now 45 to 49, and would this change our our adenoma detection rate benchmarking? They looked at over 3 million colonoscopies, and and basically 188,000 of these were in this new age range of 45 to 49 and recognize that the 50 to 75 benchmarks have clearly changed as it relates to the most recent data. Those patients that were in that 50 to 75 were now up to 39% men and 27% for women. So the composite of this is 36%, 36.8%, way above the 25%. But what if we incorporate now the 45 to 49? Well, they found that the, the numbers were changed very nominally and the adenoma detection rate would decrease to likely uh, to 34% for men and 31.8% for women. So again, modest, uh, minimal decreases. If In fact, if you saw 25% of your patients now in that 45 to 49, the authors extrapolated your ADR would fall down by 2%. And if you had 50%, which is inconceivable, I guess, but your ADR would fall down 5%. So it's unlikely to really change, but recognize these benchmarks are so much higher than what we saw defined as quality, which is 25%.
again, we need to move the benchmarks and move the, th the move the guidelines, uh, move the goalposts. Another was very concerning as relates to pancreatic cancer. This was a really a, a eye opener from the standpoint of using the surveillance epidemiologic uh, epidemiology and end results for the SEER database and increasing rise of pancreatic cancer. We've seen it increasing over the last two decades. They looked at 20, uh, 20, uh, 2000 to 2018 and found the incremental rise for men and women, but there was a discriminant. At 50, the men seemingly continue to rise and the parallel was not so evident for women. But in the lower threshold ages, in particular looking at 15 to 34 year olds, there was a phenomenal difference as it relates to younger women. And in fact, it's projected to be 400% that of the counterpart men by 2040. Again, way eye-opening, earth-shattering numbers. We need to be looking at younger women in this class of therapy, uh, class of disease, perhaps better and, and more improvement in screening, but improvement of diagnosis as we relate to onset of early symptoms. And perhaps that would lead us to better therapies, which are pretty abysmal overall for pancreatic cancer. And finally, one on eosinophile-related gastrointestinal diseases. This is something we recognize certainly north of the stomach as it relates to EOE, but we're needing to recognize it south of the, the esophagus going forward. And this is a study coordinated by Dr. Nick Talley, an international multi-center study, looking at over 550 patients recruited with chronic GI symptoms, uh, ranging from anything from functional diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, functional dyspepsia, but doing a programmatic biopsy in these patients, looking at normal and abnormal tissue and biopsying the stomach. And the, the threshold was here, eight gastric biopsies and four duodenal biopsies routinely done, blindly read by a uh, GI pathologist. And lo and behold, they found that using the threshold of 30 eosinophiles per high power field in five gastric fields and in the same threshold in three duodenal fields led to the diagnosis of these, these eosinophile associated gastrointestinal diseases of 45% in these patients, 6% in control. So what do we need to do? We need to biopsy more in both uh, normal and abnormal tissues. There's discriminant in the stomach seem to be more prevalent, uh, more uh, diagnosis that seem to come from the antrum. So again, changing perhaps therapies, looking at expanding uh, the diagnosis and recognition because the treatment strategies certainly are evolving in this class of diseases and we need to do better, but recognizing the eosinophilic diseases lay south of the esophagus and we need to do better in the definition. So lots of new concepts. Some are, I think, eye-opening. Some are earth shattering as far as changing practice now or informing practice going forward. But again, exciting words from the American College of Gastroenterology annual meeting. Hopefully this is meaningful to your practice. Dr. David Johnson, thanks again for listening.